This is Patrice Welling with Elsevier Global Medical News. I'm here with Dr. Howard Shear from Memorial Sloan Kettering at the 2009 uh, Genital Urinary Cancer Symposium where he's just presented some interesting data on a novel agent, MDV 3100. Doctor, could you please describe what makes MDV 3100 such an attractive candidate for prostate-resistant cancer? What makes this a very interesting candidate is that it is rationally designed to address and specifically target alterations that have been found in, in molecularly characterized castration resistance prostate cancers. We've learned over time that although many people consider these tumors to be quote hormone refractory because the patients have progressed on primary hormonal therapy, in point of fact they are still driven by the androgen receptor and their growth is dependent on androgen, androgen signaling. As we have learned more about the molecular biology of these tumors, we know that they are different than the prostates that are obtained at the time of diagnosis or removed by surgery. And what happens to the androgen receptor in over half of the cases is that they will overexpress the androgen receptor or there may be specific mutations or there be, may be more copies of the androgen receptor gene itself. In addition, we've learned that prostate cancers actually learn to make their own androgens. And in the setting of overexpressed receptor, we believe they become hypersensitive to this pathway. Um, there are now a couple of agents which are in late stage development um, targeting um, the androgen overproduction. This is a compound called uh, abiraterone. But the MDV compound was developed as a new anti-androgen designed to address the molecular alteration of overexpressed receptor and at the same time not to have any of the stimulatory effects which have been observed with the anti-androgens that are currently in use. But what's been particularly gratifying is as soon as we saw responses, um, we expanded the enrollment of the trial to include um, a reasonable number of patients who had not received chemotherapy, where you typically think of using more hormonal agents, and at the same time patients who have failed chemotherapy, where you don't typically think of using hormonal agents. And we saw responses in both groups. And because the, in part, the development and the regulatory pathway is a little bit easier in the post-chemo population, and there is no standard of care for that group, um, we have opted to move forward in phase three in the post-chemotherapy setting first, mm -hmm. and then we'll, um, assuming that goes well, we'll then uh, obviously move it earlier into the, the course of the illness. You did identify a dose response trend in the current study. Mm -hmm. Have you identified the best dose per day? Um, we're debating slightly on what the final phase three dose will be. Um, at the lowest doses, if you look at, at the proportion of men who showed significant PSA drops, that's in the 80-90% um, range, it was a little bit lower than the intermediate doses. Um, we did encounter fatigue in some of the higher doses, and um, um, we'll likely go somewhere in the middle in the phase 3 dose, but that final decision hasn't been made. Any other toxicities? Um, we did see at the very highest dose um, seizures. In a seizure in one patient and a second one at a slightly lower dose and obviously you're investigating that very very carefully. What is your next step? Phase three. Phase three. Um, the trial has been written. Um, it's currently undergoing regulatory review and we hope to have it uh, up and running um, probably by the third quarter this year. Oh really? Thank you very much doctor. I do appreciate your time. This is Patrice Wenling from Elsevier Global Medical News. Thank you. Thank you sir.